How is the weather where you are? Uh, <laughs> man, here in Western Wisconsin, it was, and I know other parts of the world, my daughter lives in Austin, Texas, and they're in like day 50 of over 100. But for Wisconsin, yesterday was crazy. It was like 105 degrees or so, really high humidity. That um, humidity is a little unusual for us. So it was a really good day to be in the shop. And a couple of people have asked, I do have air conditioning in this building. Um, I try to not run it. I don't like having it on. I prefer having the doors and windows open. But when it's that warm and that humid, um, one of the things in regard to tools that's interesting is on my cast iron, uh, on, if I go for a long period in the summer without running the AC, they'll get kind of a gray cast to the cast iron. And it's just a little bit, surface rust is a little too strong a word, but it's kind of, I don't know, it's oxidizing. Um, so that tells me I need to run the AC and drive some of the humidity out. But we're not here to talk about um, heat, humidity, and rust. We're here to talk about being able to do dados and rabbits, notches on a miter saw. So this is one of these things that, um, you know, it's kind of like a rabbiting ledge on a jointer. People don't really know it's there. If they do know it's there, they don't know what it's for or how to use it. So this is a feature that many sliding miter saws have. And um, it's not to say like, <clears throat> if I was doing a bunch of dados for cabinet work, I'm still gonna put a dado head on my table saw or I'm gonna use a handheld router. But if you need to cut a notch or a dado or a rabbit and do one of them, it's really good to know that you can do it here. What brought this to my brain recently is that I had to build a big crate for a tool and I had to put notches in the runners, the two by fours under the crate so that a forklift could get under those runners. And I did all of that here on the miter saw. And it was just so much faster than setting up a dado head or anything else. And it worked great. So I thought, all right, if, if I had kind of forgotten about this, maybe other people don't know about it. So um, the key to this is I'm gonna zoom you in and when I do, I'm gonna take you to this part of the saw right here. And I'm showing you while, while the camera's out wide, I'm showing you this so that once it comes in, you're gonna have a relative perspective of where you are. So zoom, 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 zoom. And we're headed for this right here. Like the slowest zoom ever. All right, now here's the deal. Right there, there's a bolt. This is like a stop rod on a plunge router. Normally, when we use the saw, that bolt, that stop rod can just pivot through. And what you can't see in this frame is that here, the blade is going all the way down into the table. That's my normal through cut. The key to this is this other black thing here that shelf that I just tipped down is like a turret on a stop rod. I mean, a turret on a plunge router. So now when I pivot that down, the stop rod hits it. And the stop rod is threaded. So I can loosen this wing nut. And then I can loosen that wing nut. And then I can change the depth of cut by adjusting the threads. So let me, I'm gonna zoom you out a little now that you see the detail. So when that shelf is out of the way, that's our normal operation of the miter saw. When I flip the shelf down, and then we're gonna adjust that stop, that's controlling how deep the saw goes. So it's a, the, the setup on this is stupid easy. What I'm gonna do, this is the material I'm gonna cut a dado in. I'm gonna go about halfway and I'm gonna define that by just striking a line in the approximate center, bring the blade down, and then by adjusting the stop, well, it's pretty darn close already. It's just a little bit too deep. By adjusting that stop, I'm gonna control how deep the saw cuts. That's pretty good right there. So all I'm doing is I'm advancing or retracting that bolt 
and that's relative position to the table. Now the other setup thing that we have to do, if you drop the material for your demo, if you just put your material against the fence, what happens is you'll get to the end of the travel, but if we look at it from here, see how the saw hasn't quite completed the cut yet. So let me see if I can get this a little better for you without trying to not have to move the camera a hundred times. Right there at the back of the cut, in this position, we'll have a full depth dado out here on the front. We won't have a full dado on the back because of the curve of the saw blade. In normal cross cut operations, when the blade is in the table, here, we can cut all the way through. When it's here, up against the stop, we can't. So the other thing you need to do is get a sacrificial piece on the fence that pushes this piece further out and I'll change the camera here now so you can see better. I need to add this sacrificial piece that's one and a half inches wide. Now when I come through and make that cut that gives me enough clearance that I'm going to have a full dado depth all the way across. So you've got to push this. You've got to push the target material out a little bit. The other thing that's going to come in to play with this, it's a benefit. I'm going to put this on the saw. And back on this end, I'm going to put a clamp to hold it in that exact position. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cut into this piece. Let me get my hearing protection on. Get this guy out of the way. So the important part of this is that clamp being in place so that this position can't change left to right. Now, if you've watched my stuff before, You've seen me do things like this, and I often refer to them as a line of cut indicator. So for what's gonna happen next, you're gonna be better off if you are a little more head on. So give me a sec. This is the piece we're gonna cut the dado into. This is the piece we're dadoing for. So all I'm gonna do is take a nice sharp pencil, make a line, make a line. And the key to this is that those layout lines are very, very close. They're right on the corner of the board. You don't have to square all the way across because the miter saw is gonna cut squarely for you. So when I go to do my dado, that line defines the right side of the dado, that line defines the left. I'm gonna use that cut that I put in the fence to show me where to put the board. That pencil line I just created, the right one is on the right side of the curve. Cut, 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 cut. The line that defines the left side of the dado goes on the left side of the kerf, and that's gonna finish me on that side. So, like this, line that up with the right. Go all the way through. Move over a little bit. Line up the left line. Yeah. 
then, let's see how I did. There we go. So, a couple things. Gonna push you back out. So, one, camera's really crooked. Two, obviously, that is, it's a lot of cuts. So the dose of reality, if I was doing eight dados, it would drive me nuts to have to do whatever that was, eight or 10 cuts per dado in order to finish that. The other thing, you might've seen it when the camera was in close, um, depending on the geometry of your blade, if you have an alternate tooth blade in there, it's gonna leave little high spots in the bottom of the dado. It's very easy to knock those out with a chisel. When I was creating the notch for those, for that pallet, I didn't care that there were high spots in the bottom. So that's an it depends. Um, if you really are doing a dado where you need a glue surface on the bottom, you're gonna have to run a chisel through there to take those high spots down. This dado came out just a little bit oversized. That's on me for not lining up my pencil lines as accurately as I could have. Um, so with a dado head, we set it to the width of our material, the thickness of our material, and every dado you cut is gonna be right. With this, you're subject to you moving the board. But again, the gain is in, I mean, it's only, it's not even quarter after 11 yet. Um, so including me talking, in just minutes, we set up and cut a dado. And at this point, I'd maybe be done putting a dado head in the table saw and ready to make the first test cut. So the, the benefit to it is speed. Um, and maybe you don't own a dado head. So this gives you another opportunity, another option. Let me look for questions. Yeah, so Bill says, is your blade a flat bottom blade? So it's, um, that style of blade is actually called a triple chip grind. It'll just say TCG on the packaging usually. That's the blade style that gives you a flat tooth instead of, I'm sorry, um, I gotta think a second, not triple chip, flat top grind. Triple chip is different. You're looking for a flat top grind, FTG. That's a blade style that will give you a perfectly flat bottom dado. This is an alternate top bevel, an ATB. And that's what's usually in my miter saw because it gives me the smoothest finish on end grain. And ATB gives you the smoothest cut quality. Um, so again, that compromises, there's little peaks in the bottom of the dado and you'd have to go back and clean those out with a chisel if you wanna have a good quality dado because you're counting on glue strength, glue bond between the end of the piece that you're putting in there and the bottom of the dado. What else for questions? This was a very fast demo. Um, the other thing that's cool about this is of course, I am at this stage of the game, I'm cutting at 90 degrees, but if you had to do a dado or a rabbit at an angle, we can use the same approach and this would be a very easy way to put a dado in a piece of material at 22 and a half degrees instead of at 90 degrees which would be on a miter saw, I'm sorry, on a table saw, that would involve using your miter gauge. On a router table, it would be pretty tough to execute at all. So um, another benefit to doing this is that ability to do stuff at an angle. If we were doing this to create a rabbit on the end, it's exactly what we just did, except that you are doing all your work out here on the end of the piece instead of in the center of the piece where we did this in order to create a data. So um, cool technique, and I guess it went so well, there aren't even questions. So um, cool technique, great thing to know about. It's like I said earlier, it's in that category of um, having, a, having a rabbiting table on your jointer and just you should know about these things so that in a onesie twosie basis, or if you just need a fallback position in order to create a joint, 
you can do something like that, rabbits and dados, here on your miter saw instead of setting up a dado head or trying to do this work on a table saw or router table. All right, I'm tap dancing just a little bit just to give the opportunity for any more questions. Um, we are at the end of the month, so we do not have a Thursday Night Live today. Our next Thursday Night Live will be coming up in September. Um, the uh, We've had some in the past, if you've not seen them, some exceptionally good ones, I think. One was with uh, Derek, who just a little bit ago was here talking about um, working with kids in schools. That was very informational. And then, of course, the one a few months ago with Chris Lyons, um, speaking of school, school's about to start. If you're looking for projects to do with kids, Chris Lyons had many, many, many years as a tech ed teacher in a public school. And so one of the things he did, in addition to talking about teaching kids, was he provided projects, kid-friendly projects. So that's um, a few months back on that live, but they're all archived here on WWGOA. So you can go back and um, you can go back and catch that. Bill says, does it make a difference on a 10 or 12 inch miter saw? You know, um, either one would be the same. Your block, the size of your block might change on a different diameter blade. But the, the key is really just, if the saw has this stop on it that I showed you at the beginning, you're gonna be able to do this. And that's the, you gotta have that stop in order to be able to stop the depth of cut. But any miter saw that has that functionality is going to be able to do this for you. Uh, Mark says, after buying a chop saw, I wished I would have bought a sliding miter saw, especially with a zero back. Oh, zero back. So um, I think what he means by that is like a saw like this, there are no rails back here. So this can be right up against a wall. On a lot of sliding miter saws, whatever distance you have out to the front, you also have to have behind the saw because rails or tubes are projecting out the back. So when we've got these collapsing arms, um, it doesn't take such a deep footprint. Uh, Rufus says, I guess you could have used a stop block off to the end to make a perfect size dado. Yep. Um, it, you, so you could do a series of test cuts and know the stop block to stop block is giving you the dado you want. So again, it just depends on what your end game is, what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, Dennis says, what about norms on his radial arm saw? Sure, dado head on a radial arm saw or same thing, repetitive cuts. Um, my insurance company does not allow me to have a radial arm saw because I do classes in here and students, um, they don't care if insurance doesn't care if I use a radial arm saw, but students in my classes cannot use a radial arm saw. So that's one of the reasons I don't have one. Uh, Bill says, at least a dozen ways to cut dados depending on what tools you have in your shop. Yep, yeah, true. All right, this was good. Fast 20 minute lesson on dados, daddy-o. Bob says, fence on my miter saw is slightly off square. How do I adjust it? Depends on the saw. So on some saws, you adjust the fence. You gotta read your owner's manual. Um, on some saws, there are bolts that go through the fence. And when those bolts are loose, you can move the fence independently of the base. On other saws, like this one, um, bolts go through the protractor here on the front. The protractor is what, when that engages, it's locking into that protractor. The bolts that go through the protractor are in oversized slots. So by loosening those bolts, when, when, if the bolts weren't in there at all, there would be no lock point. So in this case, you adjust, you loosen those bolts, adjust to 90, lock the bolts back in. But yeah, check the owner's manual for your particular saw. All right. Giving it another look. Making sure I didn't miss any. All right, great, fast tip. We're done. I'm gonna go back to um, 
a bunch of other woodworking stuff that I got to get done today. <laughs> so thanks for watching. And uh, Max, you can shut us down.